Hello, I'm Richard Gehring, and I'm speaking with Navid Sharwani, who is president and CEO of OpenSilicon. Now, OpenSilicon is a fabulous ASIC and SOC design company. Navid, can you tell us a little bit about how OpenSilicon works? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard. OpenSilicon is a company that was founded uh, on the principle that the predictability and reliability is the most important thing that uh, our customers need in ASICs. Uh, we started out as a very conventional AC company in which we would take RTL or netlist from the customers, uh, do all that is required, package, test, uh, physical design, get the chips uh, in a working stage, and then supply silicon to our customers. In recent years, we have moved from that to become what we call a derivative company. Derivative company is the one which does a spec handoff to an existing chip, and our customers let us know what changes that would like to make a chip, and we do that in four spaces, networking, telecom, storage, and computing. OpenSilicon has the capability of taking a chip and modify the chip uh, mm -hmm. to a new customer spec. So that is kind of the reincarnation of OpenSilicon as a derivative AC company. All right, and what process nodes are you working with? Uh, currently, I think most of the chips which are going into silicon are at 40. Most of the mm -hmm. design is moving to 28. Uh, we have just completed our flow development at 22 nanometer. Okay, great. Now, you recently announced this on time or on us program, which I think is a kind of a unique thing. How does it work? Well, we have got a lot of interest from the market on this program. The idea of the program is very simple, that if open silicon, uh, based on the uh, the schedule that we have committed to you, we are unable to meet the schedule, which basically means we are, if we are even one day late mm -hmm. in delivering the working protos to you, OpenSilicon will refund the design and RE back to you. Uh, that, uh, whenever we say something like that, people say, oh, that basically means that you're going to inflate your schedules and then try to meet the inflated schedule. Mm -hmm. Well, it is my belief that we don't set schedules, customers and markets do. Only we can do is that meet or beat that schedule. The, this program is actually based on our eight, nine year of research on how to build believable schedules, how to meet mm -hmm. schedules, and all the operations research that we have done in critical buffer management, which allows us to build much more scientific uh, schedules than mm -hmm. I believe anybody else in the field. And this offer is based on statistical analysis is that how many chips are actually late in open silicon and if they are late, how late are they? Mm -hmm. And based on that analysis and doing financial analysis of that, we know that we can actually offer something like that and not lose money doing that. So this program is more of a statement by open silicon that after mm -hmm. eight years of research, we have reached a point that we can offer and we can put our money behind uh, the statement that many people make, make that they are predictable. We are the first company in the history of semiconductors that we are putting our money where our mouth is. So this suggests that you can look at a chip, you can look at a, a job and have a pretty good idea, is it gonna take five weeks? Is it gonna take eight weeks? Absolutely, I think uh, because we work in a narrow field, mm -hmm. in the areas of networking, telecom, storage, and computing, mm -hmm. because we have done 250 odd projects in the last uh, seven years, based on that, I don't believe that we get a project which is completely off of the left field. We get most projects which we have seen something like before. Secondly, we operate in derivatives, which means the project is well known to us, project is well known to the customer. So in that arena, you should be able to predict the schedule much more than in a completely green field ASIC development where you are pushing the technology and doing several new things, IP is new, everything is new. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about those projects. Open Silicon is not about those projects. So I think in the kind of projects that we do, it is possible to do the, do the scientific analysis and build a more believable and execution-oriented schedule. All right. Now, are you using externally sourced IP for most of your SOC work? Absolutely. We okay. use a lot of uh, pieces of IP from uh, many different vendors. Okay, and this raises a question. What if there's a schedule delay that's really due to one of your IP providers? Yeah, th that's a very good question. Uh, so in this program, we are not saying that all the IP initially will be in the program. Mm -hmm. So what Open Silicon is doing is that we are not, actually not, we are not even offering all the fabs. So there are certain fabs, there are certain package houses, there are certain IP vendors that we trust, believe, that they have the same schedule commitment as we do. Others mm -hmm. don't. So initially, when the customer will approach us with this, uh, with this particular chip, we will look at the IP list, we look at the fab selection, package selection, test selection. Based on that, we can say that uh, have we approved all of these people, have we worked with all these guys, and we believe they have the same schedule commitment. So we believe that that is actually making a very bold statement 
about those pieces of IP that we put our name behind that because we know it works. Mm -hmm. We know that we have integrated it. We know that we can do that in time. So eventually, we hope it will motivate the IP vendors to get into the program and, and try to work with us to certify their IP as well uh, to be also an on-time IP, mm -hmm. not just making claims about, oh, we know our IP works. Well, we have to make the IP work in that particular application, in that particular integration environment, and make the silicon work the first time. Mm -hmm. What's the quality of the IP you're seeing these days? Uh, has it improved or are there still some rough areas? I think the basic issue I see with the IP industry is that people who are selling IP are not the people who sell silicon. Mm -hmm. As a result, there is a, a big gap between uh, people who know the silicon and people who know the IP. So most of the IP vendors that we meet uh, actually have maybe one test chip or two test chips. And they are selling IP to major silicon providers. Mm -hmm. But the major silicon providers then don't share their yield data, their experience or back with the IP vendor. As a result, IP vendors are mostly depending on the test chip data, not the real silicon data. So what Open Silicon has to do is to put that IP into pieces of silicon since we sell pieces of silicon, millions of them mm -hmm. to our customers. We have our own yield data, we have our own integration data. We use that data to see if the IP will work or not work. So that is what I see as a major issue in the IP industry, is that IP industry is, uh, is consolidating, but unfortunately the consolidation is happening under the banner where the people who don't sell silicon don't have real silicon experience. I don't consider doing one test chip or two test chip as a silicon experience. I believe silicon experience comes when you have integrated a piece of IP into a, a silicon, in fact many pieces of silicon run many, many, uh, million units and see how when the process shifts, when process moves, what happens to that IP because we, sh we push the IP to the limit. There are many marginality issues. IP that may initially work in a mm -hmm. test chip may not work in a real environment, may work but may not work in a high volume environment. So I think that I see as a major issue that small IC, uh, IP houses don't have wherewithal to do even the test chips. Bigger IP houses do, do test chips but I think it doesn't cut it. We need to have a very strong partnership, people who sell IP and the people who actually sell silicon with that IP in it, only then we can get the real data that is needed to build on time, predictable and reliable silicon. Mm -hmm. Now, do you develop your own IP and do you sell IP? Yes, we do. Uh, on very limited cases, we have done that when we feel that uh, pieces of IP are not available mm -hmm. in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a very strong position in uh, IP core called uh, uh, Interlaken. In fact, uh, uh, to the best of our knowledge, we are the only supplier of Interlaken IP now. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that particular IP, we have committed to the roadmap. We have, of course, a lot of silicon data behind it and so on and so forth. And as uh, we expand our IP capabilities, we will select those IPs where we feel that Open Silicon can bring differentiated, silicon proven, not test chip proven, mm -hmm. silicon proven IP to the marketplace. We will uh, develop that IP and bring it to the marketplace. Okay. Now, aside from the quality issue you mentioned, what challenges do you run into with the IP integration and verification? I, uh, I'm a person who has said for last seven, eight years, it is not the IP, it is not the layout, it is not RTL, mm -hmm. it is the verification mm -hmm. that is the biggest challenge that faces hardware industry. I believe that unlike many other industries, in, in particular software industries, we have not uh, developed our verification system in a hierarchical method in which starting from uh, students going to universities, learning verification as an inherent part of doing design, people growing up in the companies, learning how to do small chip design, inherently verifiable. As a result, what we find ourselves in an exponential verification nightmare now. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about IP. I think the overall verification of chips has, has reaching a uh, critical stage. If you look at all major microprocessors, they are not inherently verifiable. In fact, mm -hmm. all major microprocessors are sold with very large errata now. Errata is a statement by the company saying that I can't verify the whole thing. There are states in the uh, finite state machine that are not inherently uh, verifiable. So as, as I see that as the chips are becoming integrated, they are becoming SOCs, which means chips have complete other chips in them which were not mm -hmm. originally verified to begin with you can see the exponential verification nightmare. IP only adds to that. Yeah. So, so I think as an industry, we have to commit ourselves 
to becoming an IP reuse. Mm -hmm. Reuse in a verifiable manner, which means if I take a piece of another chip, stick it to another one, that piece was already verified, and I am only now verifying the interface. I'm not mm -hmm. verifying anything else. Believe it or not, we have customers and we have chips that we have looked at. They're not even uh, flop to flop inside a block, which means mm -hmm. timing paths run through multiple blocks. So you can imagine mm -hmm. that it is not even possible to do any uh, timing verification without having to say take several blocks instead of just one block at a time. Mm -hmm. so, so I think verification is a huge challenge for our industry. And unless we start, what I said, from the textbooks, from the universities, to people growing up, learning verification, and making verification uh, and reuse as our daily life, something mm -hmm. I am working with our customers saying that if you're going to do one chip with me and not reuse it, I'm not sure if my engineering should be spending time on doing that. Yeah. We should do everything that is reusable and then maybe 80, 90% reusability, 20, 10%, you know, integration. But that's way how we can conquer this verification nightmare that we are walking into right now. Okay, well said. Thank you, Navi. Thank you very much.